Hello friends. So I knit this jumper, right? This is the second jumper I ever knit. I knit my partner a jumper and then immediately after decided I would knit myself a jumper, this jumper, and it took me six years. <laughs> So that's not going to work. Recently I've been getting more and more bought jumpers, as in not particularly fancy. I really like jumpers, is where I'm going with this. I've discovered that I really like jumpers and I would love more jumpers, but I do not have the time, the energy, the patience, the dedication to hand knit jumpers. That's just not happening. There's a few possible solutions to this, and I think it will surprise no one watching this channel that I picked the most exciting one. Some time ago now, I watched a video Video that introduced me to knitting machines. And as soon as I knew that it was possible to use a machine to knit, I needed one. Obviously, I didn't want to spend a load of money on a craft I might not end up gelling with, so I spent some time on eBay, and after a bit, I ended up getting a very nice vintage Singer knitting machine. And then I didn't do anything with it for about four months because it occurred to me that now I had to learn how to actually use it, which is where you come in because in this video, I'm gonna learn how to use it. So welcome to my spare room, which is the only place where I had space to set this up. This is the box. It's a little worse for wear. Given that this thing is older than I am, it's probably doing all right. Now this is the bit where I get a little bit sneaky and tell you that I have actually already opened this, but everything is in there as it should be. First of all, we have the manual, the Singer SB100, and we're gonna be spending a lot of time with this and its vintage diagrams. This, I'm still not 100% on what this is. It might be, I think with machine knitting, you can do like you do in hand knitting, where you put in a safety line if you're going to rip back or do something weird. Maybe that's that, I don't know. It's too stiff and sort of plasticized to actually work through the machine, so I don't know what that's supposed to be for, but it's in there. It came with some random yarn. I think that's DK and is such, is too thick. This is obviously the machine itself, which we'll look at properly in a moment. So I had to get it open because one, I wanted to check it was okay, but also this end piece was pretty shattered and I've managed to glue that back together. You can see on the other side, it's completely fine. Does this have cat hair on it already? What else do we have in the box? We have this, which I believe is called a selector tool. Um, so you can select every other needle or every two needles skipping over one. This is a latch hook, which I've seen that you use a lot. And this is just a hook hook. I'm still a little, little unclear on what that's for, but I'm sure we'll find out. There's two clamps for attaching it to the table. There's two weights that are all hooky. So they don't weigh a huge amount, but they've got teeth on them. So you can hook them onto the work. It's got this little tool, which this seems to be the main tool you use for moving stitches around and doing any kind of hand manipulation. So I imagine I'll be getting very used to that. It's got some spare needles, which I understand is good. Those are very desirable. And then it's got what quite honestly looks like a quick start guide. Okay, first things first, clamp. Okay, zero centered in front of me. And now I guess we get the manual out. Needle bed, carriage, flow combs. Okay, clamp socket, table clamps, got that. Needle selector tool, yes. Needles, eyelet tool, latch hook, edge weights. Front rail pusher? Front rail pusher. Well, we'll see if it tells me to use it. Along the front of the needle bed, there is a graduating scale of numbers. This will be used to center your knitting. The numbers indicate the needle numbers from zero in the center. Always start your knitting by selecting needles each side of center zero. This will help you when increasing and decreasing the zeros right there. Cool. There are four needle positions. Needle position A, which is where we're at now. This is called the non-working position. Position B, which is that one. In this position, the butts of the needles are slightly forward and the hooks of the needles are in line with the front of the needle bed, brackets, the flow combs. This is called working position one. C. In this position, the needles are even further forward. This time, the tip of an open latch lays slightly beyond the flow combs. This is called working position two and is the line indicated towards the front of the needle bed. And then position D. Here the needles are all the way forward and the butts are up against the front slide rail. This is called the holding position. Using the selector switch, you can move needles from working position one to working position two and vice versa. So that is...
this guy. So I think if I do that, hey. Stitch sizes, casting on most yarn, stitch size one. Very fine yarns, one to two, fine yarns, three to four, four ply or equivalent, that's sock weight, five to six. Thick yarn, seven to eight. Double knitting yarn, nine to 10. What is thick yarn if it's not double knitting? And then chunky, 10 to 12, over alternate needles. I'm sure they'll explain that later. If double knitting is thicker than thick yarn, but four ply is thinner than thick yarn, what is thick yarn? Let's not worry about that right now. Exercise one, no yarn is used, cool. You've now selected 34 needles into working position one, i.e. 17 either side of zero. I'm not sure I was quite. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 70. Yeah, okay, well, it, it is 34. Press the needle selector switch in at the back of the carriage and gently move the carriage across the needles you selected. The needles remain in position one. That was anticlimactic. Now press the switch in at the front of the carriage, carriage across the needles in position one, they have now moved to position two, your normal knitting position. Okay, set the stitch dots number one. I've already done that. See when hooks of the needles are in line with the front of the needle, I guess. Now set the stitch size to number 12 on the dial. Take the carriage across again. Ah. This time using a larger stitch size, the hooks of the needles lay further back. This allows a larger stitch to be formed. Exercise two. One color, what four ply yarn is used? Oh, we're using yarn. Yeah, of course we're using yarn, Ash. This is a knitting machine. Set stitch dial to number one. Push select to switch in at back of carriage. To bring alternate needles to working position two. This is gonna take some getting used to. Open all latches. All latches are open. Okay, so I think my yarn goes down there. Lay the yarn across the selected needles and fix the end of the yarn into the yarn clip on the carriage side of the machine. Do not pull tightly, otherwise stitches cannot form. Place the cone or ball of yarn on the floor in front of you and take the carriage gently across I have already done this wrong. Let's try that one more time. Center of the needle bed, alternate needles into working position two. Lay yarn across. It's not great. I will admit I was not expecting to be troubleshooting at the casting on stage. Bring needles in between those which have already knitted into working position two. across those needles. As you do so, do not leave a loop at the edge or the carriage may jam. Okay, take carriage across. Now bring the needles you first selected again back to position two. Check that the previous form stitches are behind the latches. Other needles to work in position two, bring the carriage across. You have now produced a closed edge cast on and are ready to begin to knit in stocking stitch. Break off the end of the yarn approximately six inches from the end of knitting, remove other end of yarn from the clamp. Why? If it's your first time you've used a knitting machine, don't worry if you did not manage to cast on the first time. Below are some hints to help you. Drop stitches, carriage sticks. What do you do if the carriage sticks though? Yarn caught on carriage brushes. I hadn't even considered that. Exercise three, continue with four ply yarn. If you removed the knitting from your machine at the end of the last exercise, cast on again following the instructions in exercise two from number one to eight. We'll just keep going. Press select lever in at the front of the carriage. Without laying any yarn, take the carriage gently across the needles. Oh, that's messy. Check that the stitches are behind the open latches and that all the latches are open. Absolutely not, no. Oh, this is really messy. Maybe it'll get better. Set the stitch dial to five. Clip the yarn end into the, oh, okay. Apparently cast on 
Maybe that's something we'll look into, whether you can like carry on from the cast on instead of breaking the yarn after casting on and then going back. I don't know, a lot of people seem to use waste yarn to cast on anyway, so maybe it doesn't matter. Don't pull the yarn tightly, your stitches will not form. I'm holding it, but I'm not pulling. Take carriage across. Repeat to complete 20 rows of stocking stitch. Two, oh, you didn't. So my problem is actually not that carriage is sticking, the problem is that it's sufficiently high tension that the table is moving because the table's really light. It feels like maybe it would work better on my cutting table. But my cutting table's in use at the moment, so. I have not been counting. That feels like 20 rows. Exercise four. In this next exercise, you will learn how to increase stitches for garment shaping. Useful. Complete a closed edge cast on, bring needle to working position two, bypass, uh, knit 20 rows in stocking stitch. I did all that. I've done that. That's done. Bring one needle from non-working position on side of carriage to working position two. Open the latch. Lay yarn across needles, making sure the yarn is placed over the new needle in working position two. Increase stitches at the carriage side in the same way. Increase 10 times altogether. What are we making? Four. Another method of increasing can be used when it is necessary to increase a stitch at both ends at the same row. You know, it's not told me to hang weights. Everyone hangs weights. Weights seem important. I'm just, I'm gonna do it. I realize I've just done it and I'm about to do a whole bunch of manipulation and that might be bad. Oh well, bring a needle at both sides of the knitting from non-working position to working position one. Pick up the lower loop of the first stitch using the single eyelet tool, it's that guy, and lift it up onto the hook of the needle. I have a problem is that I've just increased already. Okay, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna knit one more row. Stitches to no! Okay, so that's what happens when you don't put the yarn across properly. It throws itself off the needles. A couple of small crises averted. I think I fixed that. Probably counts as forcing it across and I'm probably not supposed to do that. Oh, I've knitted loads now that I look at it. No, no, you're messing it up. You're messing it up. Let's try that again. This seems to be increasing by picking up the stitch below, the same as you would with hand knitting. You're all twisted. Why are you all twisted? Probably because of the surgery I just did. Ah, oh, you should probably get more serious about doing this properly. Knit, and yarn across needles, and knit, knit, knit. Repeat, increasing one stitch at each end of every alternate row 10 times altogether. Why? Why am I doing this so much? Is there a reason I'm doing this so much? Maybe I'm just gonna do it one time to check I really know what I'm doing. Oh, that's fiddly. That's heckin' fiddly. If I take the, the weight off, is it better? Not really. Come on. There we go. The yarn is stretched so far at the sides that doing big increases is going to be really difficult. I think you're going to have to be very gradual about it. What have I done? It's not wanting to go. What's going on? Everything seems to be fine. Is that good? Did I fix it? Apparently I fixed it. What the, what the heck was that? So I have the knitting machine set up. I have it running. Things are going okay. Not great. I was warned that the learning curve for knitting machines is kind of steep, but you know how it is. Homosexual audacity. I just figured that I'd work it out as I went along. No, I'm, I'm having some problems. So what do you do when you're struggling with something and you're not sure how to solve the problems that you're having? You get brave and you ask an expert. Hi, I'm Carson. I run a channel called Knit Factory Impel. It is a programming joke that nobody gets. By day, I'm a software engineer, but on YouTube, I make videos about knitting machines and open source knitting machine software. And I'm on a mission this year to create more machine knitters, which is why I'm here as the machine knitting fairy. And I'm very glad you are. But like you said, the learning curve is steep. We've talked a little bit about the machine I have. What kinds of knitting machines are there? What are your options if you're looking to get a knitting machine? Oh, there are so many options. Domestic knitting machines became popular 
in about the 1950s, and they were manufactured all the way up until, I'd say, the early 1990s, and then most of them kind of died out. Not really sure why. From my understanding, it's that commercially knit pieces became more viable, so like home knitting wasn't as big a deal. But there are a lot of vintage knitting machines. For the first few decades, they were like plain knitting machines, like you get a lot of stockinette, but not a whole lot else. And then the patterning started to show up, I think, in the 70s, and then we got punch card machines, where you got a few stitches, you didn't get the whole bed. Where you could do patterning, you could do fair aisle, and tuck stitches, interesting things, all controlled by punch cards. And then we got a whole line of electronic machines. The ones that I work with are the Brother Knitting Machines, and recently, I guess in the last like five, six years, the AYAB project has popped up to retrofit some of the vintage Brother Knitting Machines that were electronic to be controlled by computer instead of the Mylars, or like they have a, a button interface where you can manually program patterns in that is not very user-friendly, but we're, we're making that better. These days, only the LK150 and the Silver Reed Machines are still manufactured. There is a company in China called Titexma that's making something punch card shaped, but those are really rare. So if you want to buy a new machine, you can. The vintage knitting machines are still really in really good shape. They were solid metal and you can find the manuals and the even the service manuals online. So if you're comfortable doing your own maintenance, you absolutely can still fix things and get replacement parts for some of them. That's good to know, given that my machine is a, a teeny bit temperamental. I think maybe needs some, some cleaning. Temperamental how? Sometimes the stitches at the very end will just drop off instead of hook the yarn. Do you have edge weights? I do, but I'm not always, I think I'm maybe not always using them in the best way. Yeah, try moving them up about every dozen rows or so and that'll help the edges knit better. That might not be an issue with your machine. I'm also willing to chalk things up to user error, but also I think like the channels maybe need a little bit of a clean and an oil. The stuff in them. That tends to happen over time, like the fluff builds up in the oil. This metal bit here, it screws on and it unscrews itself. And I haven't figured out if that's a feature or a bug. That feels like a bug. It feels like a bug, but I don't know if it's like screwable because you're supposed to be able to like adjust it somehow. I don't know what's up with that yet. If it's supposed to be screwed in all the time or if you're supposed to be able to adjust it. So this is not a machine that I'm familiar with given there are so many different vintage knitting machines out there. Most of the mechanisms are the same. And if there's a service manual somewhere, then that would be ideal. You know where to find the manuals? That was going to be my next question. Where are some good places to find resources? So there's machine knitting, etc which is mkmanuals.com. They have every single machine knitting manual I've ever needed and the service manuals. There's also a machine knitting discord that is a great place to go ask questions and the community has grown significantly over the last few years. Is that something that's happening in general? Like is machine knitting getting more popular again? I think so. From what I understand, when hand knitting gets more popular, machine knitting also gets more popular. It's just such a small thing that it rarely breaks into the mainstream. Thinking about it, I know a lot of pandemic knitters, so I wonder if that's also driving people towards like other crafts. I'm a pandemic machine knitter. We all had to do something. Later on, you will learn how to produce Italian decreasing for raglan designs. But in this exercise, we use the simple method of decreasing. Using your eyelet tool, double end, two needles hooks. See figure I. Yes. Push the tool, keeping it level, right back until the stitches move onto the tool from the needle. With the two empty needles in working position, one. Those instructions don't make a lot of sense, but I think I've done it right because I've got the stitches on the tool. Wait, are you just telling me how to get stitches on and... Because you're, you're telling me to put them straight back on, but I don't want them back on. I want them here. Okay, now we're actually going to do a decrease. Single eyelet onto the end needle hook. Take it up. This does extremely slow step by step, but quite honestly, watch a video. Anyway, there you go. Put it on to the next one. Check that the empty needle is out of working position in position A, non-working position. Stop switching back and forward. We've been doing double increases, so we'll do double decreases. Okay, maybe I understand why they want you to practice, because <laughs> I have just thrown a bunch of stitches around and dropped some of them off. So that's another double decrease. 
Exercise six, you also decrease stitches at neck openings, but first you will need to learn how to perform partial knitting. Do you mean short rows? Oh, partial knitting is the term used when only knitting part of the garment. For example, at a V neck, you will only knit one side at a time, decreasing on the center of the needle bed for the V shaping and at the armhole edge at the same time. Bring the needles on the opposite side of the carriage from zero to the edge in the holding position. As you knit, lay the yarn over the needles in working position to, oh, this is really fiddly. As you pass the carriage across, take it over onto the needles in holding position if necessary, but don't worry, the needles in holding position will not knit. Correct. They did not knit. Oh, this is, this is why I'm practicing. I should probably have picked a more tightly spun yarn than this one, but I didn't think this one was loosely spun. Okay, yeah, maybe it is a good idea that they're getting me to practice with the tool because I'm not very good with the tool. Ah. Well, that'll be how you get it off the machine. We're starting over again in the next one anyway, so I guess we'll just uh, take a break there. That's cool though. Knit a thing. It got bigger and then it got smaller. Didn't make too many mistakes. Exercise seven, at the base of a garment, you will usually have a hem or rib welt. This exercise shows you how to make a simple hem. Four cast on rows using color two, done that. Knit one row in color three with yarn ends at side of carriage. Leave yarn ends two and three hanging at sides. Okay, so I need a contrast. Knit one row using main yarn, knit some rows. Press needle selector in knit one row. It's got a big hole in it, but whatever, we don't care. Using the single end of your eyelet tool, pick up the loops of main color from in between the loops of your first row knitted in color three. Okay, 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 let's, let's think about this. They're so small is the problem. Does it mean that one? I will admit that this is slightly unintuitive, but I think I'm doing it right. I don't know, I think is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Okay, so I now have two stitches on each one. Press the selector switch on the front of the carriage and without yarn, take the carriage across the needles, holding the knitting back towards the needle bed with your other hand. No, it's just straight up falling off those ones. What the hell? Break off yarn starting at side of carriage. This creates a lot of ends. I mean, this is an absolute disaster. This ends, just, we're gonna take this off the machine. But in theory, one moment caller, unconvinced I did that properly. I think I should have caught these loops, not the loops that I did catch, but it all seems to be in. It's just not very pretty. That might be something I look up a video tutorial for. Maybe that would be better. My next kind of general question was, what makes a yarn good for machine knitting? So it really depends on what you're trying to make. Yarns that are good for machine knitting are tightly spun and not, oh, what is that thing? Slubby? You don't want any novelty yarn. You don't want anything that like might get stuck in any part of the mechanism. You can knit with moha mohair, but it is a little tricky. More modern knitting machines have a spot in the tension mask to put wax that helps cut down on the fluff a little bit. And you can also find yarns that are specifically treated to run more smoothly through the machine. Color Mart in the UK sells mill end yarns. They were yarns that were used for manufacturing, so they've already been treated to go through industrial knitting machines. They feed very smoothly through your domestic knitting machine. And any TAM yarns are also in that same state. And you can get TAM yarns in the US from Knit Knack Shop. Usually it's some kind of industrial oil. And after you swatch, after you make your thing, when you wash it and block it that oil will come out so the swatches will look significantly different after they've been washed because they like fluff up and bloom and you can't like leave the yarn fluffy before you knit it because that causes problems some of the problems that i've been having so far with my machine is that i think the yarn i was using wasn't tightly spun enough it was splitting and like the, the hook wouldn't pick up all of the strands that could also happen if your yarn was a little too thick do you know what gauge your machine is this was going to be another one of my questions is that how do i find out for certain what gauge but i think it's supposed to do from like sock weight to dk at most oh that's 
awfully large. That's the very top end of the, like the scale that they've given it, and the very bottom end they've got like what they describe as very fine yarn. The middle of the scale that is in the manual is four ply or sock yarn. Interesting. So for modern knitting machines, they fall essentially into three categories. There's standard gauge, which is the smallest, mid gauge, and then bulky. Standard gauge, I believe, is 4.5 millimeters apart. Mid gauge is 6.5, and then bulky is nine. And the the distance between the needles determines how big a yarn you can use. But for your machine, it might be old enough that it was before that gauge system, but back then the machines were usually for very fine yarns. And like, as a beginner, I wouldn't go above like sock weight yarn. Exercise eight, continental or mock ribs. Oh, I don't like the sound of that. Cast on in color two as for exercise six. Position two. Stitch length one. Oh god. Well, at some point I will remember which way round the selector button works. Position one, using the single end of your eyelet tool, transfer every alternate stitch onto its adjacent needle. Hold the knitting back against the needle bed with your other hand while performing this operation to avoid dropped stitches. Every alternate stitch onto its adjacent needle. Okay. Turn empty needles to non-working position, bring needles to working position two. I wouldn't mind so much, but the needles feel super delicate, and because of how tight the stitches are, I feel like I'm having to be quite aggro with them. That feels like that went horribly wrong. Yep, yeah, it sure did. Okay, we're just gonna skip that. Pretend that didn't happen. Is this a tension problem? I think this is a tension problem. Turn empty needles to non working position. Stitch dial to three. Half as many needles need only half the tension. One row with color three. I'm not going to change as before. Change to main color and knit three rows. Knit 39 rows. Sorry. Nope. It absolutely does not want to do that. And again. And again, right, what's the problem here? We might give up on continental mock rib for now. Exercise nine, for this exercise, you will use your eyelet tool again, just due to decreasing exercise five. This time I have you be using to, to cast off. And then exercise 10 is make a jumper. Done some text swatches and I think I understand part of the problem I was having with the last set of exercises. I'm starting to think that when you have two stitches on one needle, it wants to be at a lower tension. These instructions, man. Cast on in color two as for exercise seven. On the fourth cast on row, leave the slightly to the rest of the back carriage, leave the needles in working position one. Using the single end of your eyelet tool, transfer every alternate stitch onto its adjacent needle. Turn empty needles to non-working position. Adjust stitch size dial to number three, three and a half, because I think this asks for tension a little high, I'll be honest. Keeping needle selector switch depressed at front of carriage, knit one row with color three, which is gonna use color two. Oh, that's not good. I don't think I'm supposed to do that. Change to main color and knit 39 rows. Oh, this does not at all want to play nice. That's dropped completely. Oh, that's way better. I mean, it's pulling out in the middle now, which is... Mm. Knit 39 rows. Depress switch back carriage, knit one row, returning needles to working position one. Done that. Now using the single end of your eyelet tool, pick up the loops of main colour from in between the loops made in colour. Wait, down here? Yeah, down here. Oh yeah, this one's kind of messy because I dropped a stitch. I've screwed up there somehow. That big long bit's the problem. Frustrated by the amount of counting I have to do. Making sure all of the stitches are behind the latch. All the latches are open. All the stitches are behind. Come on, change stitch to six. 
by yarn. Later when knitting is removed from the machine, pull down slightly, it's either is in shape. Fine, I will do that. But then we'll do exercise nine. Exercise nine. For this exercise, you will use your eyelet tool again, just as you did for decreasing in exercise five. This time, however, you'll be using it to cast off. Bring all needles back into working position one. Oh, hmm. Maybe I won't worry about binding off right now. I should have just put some yarn across. I think they said if you just... Oh uh, yeah, it's not ribbing but it could plausibly pretend to be ribbing. All right, well, since I've got you here, I did some gauge swatches. This was tension four, which I think is maybe a bit dense. And this is five. I've blocked these pretty aggressively, I'll be honest. And this is six, which... Six feels a little loose, but I also know that it was, it was really struggling with the eyelets on tensions four and five. But I feel like tension five is the, the tension that I want. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that's seven stitches or 12 rows per inch. So my machine didn't come with a cast on comb, but I have noticed that when I am casting on, it's often very... the yarn doesn't want to stay back against the machine and it keeps coming to the front of the needles and not sliding past the latches. Is that what a cast on comb is supposed to help prevent, or...? Kind of. So the cast on comb is a way to add weight right at the beginning. It's just like you can't stick claw weights into every single stitch or they'll get caught in the carriage. So the cast on comb like spreads that out and then you can hang weights on the cast on comb. So your knitting machine should be at a bit of an angle and the, the weight will keep the yarn down against the bed. So some of the older machines and the Bond Ultimate Sweater Machine have like these, what do we even call them? They're, they're similar to gate pegs on the uh, Brother Machines, but like levers that move up and down and hold the yarn work down and like you cast on around them and like always pulls the yarn work down so you don't need weights for those kinds of machines but it looks like your machine is closer to the way the LK150 works where it's got like these plastic bits that keep the yarn from coming in when the needle pulls in um, so you probably need a cast on comb you should be able to find one that is compatible with your machine the manual doesn't have one in there no, there wasn't one in the box and there wasn't one in the front of the manual where it says this is what's in the box. I assumed that if it exists it comes separately. So we've done many things and I feel like we are ready to make a hat. I have, I hesitate to call it a pattern, I have a diagram. I also have, courtesy of the internet, a cast on comb. So I'm hoping that this is going to... Oh yeah, it's more than long enough. That was what I very quickly discovered, is that I need 154 stitches to do 22 inches at my chosen gauge, which is only just going to fit on this machine. I have to keep remembering that heads are quite big. I had a bit of a moment where I was like, oh no, I'm not gonna be able to make jumpers on this thing, which is what I really want. No, your head is big. I'm doing all the way around your head in one go. This is fine. What is a problem is that this doesn't have a row counter. And I did get a row counter. It's magnetic and does not come with a lot of guidance. I'm gonna have to figure out a way of attaching it to this somehow, or more accurately, probably putting a magnet on this and then fixing this somewhere where it can slide apart. I'll figure it out. That's a 3D printing problem, if ever I saw one. Let's start by casting on. So 154 stitches divided by two is 77. I think I am at worst like a stitch out. It's quite confusingly numbered. The numbers land in between stitches. Back to working position. What, 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 two? All my latches are open. All my stitches are behind. This is, this is my hat such as it is. So other than the stitches dropping at the side, the other big problem that I have is I've struggled with doing eyelets. Moving the stitches over is fine, but then when I come to actually knit it, it's not always, it, sometimes it's dropping, I don't know if you can see there, sometimes it's dropping the stitches and sometimes it's just struggling a lot to knit when there's two stitches on a needle. You can get around that by 
pulling those needles all the way out. That way when the carriage passes, all the carriage needs to do is pull it back in. Usually when the carriage passes, the carriage has to push the needle out and then pull it back in. But if you have it already pushed out, the carriage has to do less work. Does your carriage have like a hold setting? You need to turn that off uh, to get that technique to work correctly. Otherwise, if you push needles all the way out, they just won't knit. I was having some trouble with the cast on comb initially because I think it's not made for this machine. It's made for a different machine. And I think it was just struggling quite a lot with, I don't think there was enough clearance between the sinker plate and the top of the hooks and that, and it was just all getting very involved. So I managed to knit down about an inch or so in the waist yarn, then hang the cast on comb. I can see that having a cast on comb would have made that first edge a lot easier, but it's okay we got there in the end that's what waist yarn is for and so now we are starting on the actual hat tension is that doesn't feel like it should have that much play in it tension is where we want it to be tell you all these hooks make your eyes go funny so we're going to knit 12 rows one two 12. Now we do the eyelets for the pico edge and turn the tension dial. Previously I was on five, done this one on a six. Okay, this is gonna take a while. Eyelets all done. Well, that could have gone worse. What happened there? And it dropped off the very last stitch. I'm gonna knit another 12 rows. One, two, twelve. So I think before when I tried the exercise for doing the folded hem, because it wasn't super clear from the written instructions, I was picking up the wrong bumps. I am more confident this time that I have the right one. Because of the weird way that my machine works, what I'm about to do is either going to work great or it's going to drop everything off or it's not going to work at all. It's dropped the end one, but only the end one, which wasn't actually too bad. Success! Okay, and now I should just be able to keep knitting. If I want to knit more things on the knitting machine, what are some good resources for finding patterns? There are a bunch of patterns on Ravelry. A lot of them are from the 70s, so the styling is not great. I also have a bunch of patterns. I have a pattern generator website and they're all up there for free. They're not perfect, but they're a pretty good starting point for most things. So when I was following your hat tutorial, I was very good. I did all my gauge swatches and I counted and I worked out based on the measurements and I'm hoping when I sew up this hat, it's gonna work. Is that the basic strategy for if you wanna make something, you make gauge swatches and you work out how many stitches and then... That's the way that I do it. There aren't really modern machine knitting patterns. I think there's one designer who is still making them, but she designs specifically for the LK150. And I believe she still goes with like a gauge. Like when your hand's knitting, they give you in the pattern, like the gauge that you're supposed to get to knit that pattern with that yarn. It's really hard to get any specific gauge with a knitting machine because you're kind of limited by what the machine can do and whatever yarn you have. So the way that I draft my patterns is like whatever gauge you get will build something specifically for you. But like if you're adapting a pattern and you can't get the gauge that so you have to redo the math for the gauge that you get. This feels like a very math heavy hobby. It's arithmetic so it's not too bad. There was a lot of me going like okay so if this is this then half of that is this and then I need to add and, and I end up three steps down and I'm like how did I get to that number? It's part of the reason that I draft my patterns in code because it's much easier to work with abstractions than it is to work with actual numbers. I can kind of get that. I'm a very hands-on person. My instinct is that I want to look at it and go well that's about that big so it must have end up to and you can't do that with the machine knitting because it's all stretched out. You have to do all the math beforehand to understand what you're going to do. I have to train myself. I watched Rachel Maxey's video and then I it was like oh you should also watch this video. It was your video w watching Rachel Maxey's video and then I was like okay so clearly I need to go down this rabbit hole. Okay. Yeah. 
So the good news is that the round the ears measurement I think is pretty much right. Maybe I would like it a bit tighter, but that's just me. The length, the length was way off. I guess I could rip back to a point and try and rehang it, but I genuinely don't think that's worth it. By the time I've done all of that fiddling around, I could probably just have re-knitted the hat. And I dropped a bunch of stitches on the pico edging anyway, and that'll mean I can fix that. Ah, <sighs> yeah. I really wanted to be like, and here's my finished hat, but I guess we're going to redo counting the gauge, unravel this, and try again. Tell us where people can find you on the internet. The YouTube is Knit Factory Info, and my pattern website is Abstract Knit Factory Factory, and I could explain to you how those things relate, but unless you are a software engineer, it's not going to make any sense. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping me out. I really appreciate it. And I hopefully I'll manage to produce something wearable at the end of this. Good luck. It's not perfect, but it is better. I like this. The fit's pretty good. It's got a little bit of room up here, but that's fine. I can always roll the hem back if I really want to wear it all the way down, or I can have it be a little bit slouchy. That's also fine. I really appreciated that when I made the first one and it didn't fit, I just frogged it and made another one. I would never have done that with hand knitting because it's not like knitting a hat takes a long time, but for me, it would still be the better part of a week just knitting a hat. This was a couple of hours with mistakes. Obviously I haven't even got into the second half of the manual yet. There's colour work in there, there's lace. I'm yet to make a jumper. The next exercise is make a child's jumper. So for that and a couple of other reasons, I think we might be revisiting this at some point. Stay tuned, I guess. I guess the inevitable project that I should be work should be working towards with this is what all the historical costuming, even adjacent people seem to want to do, which is to make the 1890s Victorian cycling sweater. But personally, I'm quite excited about the idea of exploring how I could use this to make LARP kit. And if I remember correctly, one of the Tudor Taylor books has a knitted waistcoat in it. Let's be honest, all I really want in life is a whole bunch of really cute knitted sweater vests. Maybe I should try and figure out how to make a sweater vest. Anyway, that's all for the future. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed this video and thank you so much to Carson for helping me out because I needed it. You should absolutely go check out her channel. It's really good. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to keep the YouTube gods happy. Follow me on Instagram to see pictures of my cat and sometimes what I'm working on. And down in the description box, you can find a link to my Ko-fi page where you can make a one-off or recurring donation to support this channel and my inevitable next trip to a yarn shop. You know I haven't bought yarn in like five years? That's gonna change now. Kofi supporters get early access to all of my videos, the occasional extra sneak peek, and I couldn't do what I do without their help. Now I've got knitting to get on with, so dream big and I'll see you next time. I think I mentioned last time that I've already bought a second machine.